Good evening, Craig. I'm glad you could join us after I called you four times. Yeah, I, we thought you were on vacation, taking a week off. We don't even <laughs> get weeks off. Why do you? That's not fair. Not fair. Hey, so, guys. We're, we're the Grumpy Dungeon Masters. Uh, we're not particularly grumpy. I'm not particularly grumpy at the moment. How about you? I'm very tired. I'm I'm over it with stupid characters. <laughs> okay, well, he is not uh, I assume you're not referring to uh Dungeons and Dragons characters. No, I'm referring to uh the conversation we had off the podcast months yep. ago. But it kind of can relate to somewhat the indie. I hate very intelligent characters that are very ditzy on purpose like if they do something that's very fancy and awesome with some kind of weird techno babble kind of answer and then all of a sudden they're like well man i could really go for a hyper shake and a smoothie <laughs> i just I, I can't stand that and um i had i had a really amazing topic to talk to you about t- today in this podcast for this week and then like i was like okay it's right here i'll remember it and then I'll bring it up later, and then I lost it, and then it's gone forever. So I'm going to try to remember what it is while you tell me a topic. Go. I'm, I'm on the spot. Uh, yes, you I, are. I, my name's Jay. And I'm and, Chris, and I thought we did the intro already. Let's go. Come on. Topic. <laughs> okay. So what do you do if somebody doesn't show up for a game? Uh, say you're knee-deep in the middle of a dungeon. And one of your players cannot make it that week. They have to work or, you know, their their cat died or you know, something awful where they're not actually able to make game. How do you personally handle that? I do. Well, I've run Adventure League and the whole purpose of Adventure League is not to have the same consistent group at, from session to session to session. I do not play the character PC that's missing uh, in my home game. I do not let anyone else play that PC that's missing in the home game. They just do not exist as if they never were a part of the campaign for that time that they are there. Unless that player has given specific instruction to let me or another player play their PC. And even then I am very kind of iffy about it. So that actually happened to me this last session where our Goliath uh, fighter could not make the session, but he said Mike or Dimitri, two of my other players, can play his character and that he'll watch uh, the stream because he couldn't play mm-hmm. where he was, but he could you know, pop in and watch the stream so he could still see what was going on with his character. And that is the only reason I let that character be played when he was not there. We actually I, had we had that almost exact scenario this past weekend myself for my Icewind Dale game. One of our players couldn't make it. Uh, while he wasn't able to watch, he was still in contact. Um, I allowed one other player to run his character for him. Same guy. Like they, they've, we've all known each other for years, and everybody everybody has a good handle on how all the other characters play. I, as a DM, I know how those characters play and how they react to situations as well. So if if I'm allowing somebody else to play somebody else's character and they start to do some shit that's just off the wall, I'm going to pull that immediately and say no. Uh, But like he was playing the wizard who was not at the game this weekend. Well, the wizard, he cast fireball. He cast fireball a lot. Like he's a fucking evoker. So it's pretty straightforward. Stay out of combat as much as possible. Drop nukes as often as possible. That's what the same situation for my guy. They played him as, oh, I'm going to go smash, smash, and just hit things and give people advantage. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Pretty simple concept. So um, what, what made me even cringe a little bit more and wish I had not, um, I wish the player would have been there. Uh, And, you know, things come up and it it happens. But my wife came to me after the game and was like, I guarantee you that if Sam was there in his character, he would not let us have made that ally that we made in our last session. 
And I kind of thought about it and was like, yeah, I don't think he would have. So I'm not sure how it's going to get handled when it gets back. And it's that that's the situation I don't want to handle. And that, yep, that's a hard one to deal with. There's there's not a good answer for that one, really. But what I tried, what I want to avoid is I want to avoid the situation that happened to a good friend of ours, uh, John Gula, when he was playing fifth edition in North Carolina and he was with a group. I'm not sure who was in the group other than him. He had, he had reached out to me and asked me how to make a barbarian fighter that hit real hard, you know? Yep. And, you know, I showed him the, the majesty of great weapon fighting. <laughs> yes. Great, great weapon fighting, uh, two handed, or use a great ax. You're fucking set. You know, that's, that's really all you need. And or, then, a, or, or, sorry, not a great ax. Use a great sword. It's better. And I think he dip rogue. I don't know. I don't know if I remember that fact correctly or not. Mm-hmm. Um, It'd be a weird choice, but I guess I mean it's not out of the ordinary too much. Right, but it works. It works for him. That's very. It, it, yeah, that's a fair point. It is very him. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, um, he couldn't make it to a session, and the DM told him that he was going to play his character because he couldn't make it, and then when the DM did the session and controlled John's character. He had him do things that was very uncharacteristic of the character. Now I say that knowing because John kind of plays the same character over and over again, just kind of different, different flavors, Mm -hmm. you know, he's going to be sneaky. He's going to be advantageous and he's not going to make a move until he knows that he has the the victory already ensured in that situation that just comes from knowing the man for two decades plus now right all right and he had um basically made his character do things that seemed very out of character and then failed those things that he was doing and caused a lot of in-party strife when john got back and actually played the game again and which was really weird because it's like, why would you do that to a PC? Why would you have the PC who's not there do something controversial that's going to be and make the, the party mad, then fail at it? Okay. Even if the dice failed the roll, why, why would you even put them in the spot to begin with? And then why would you not have it just being beneficial favor, just hand wave that roll away? So I, I have a hard fucking rule on this. Sorry, uh, it, very quick interrupted. If if they are going to run somebody else's character, or if I'm running it, the only thing that character does is combat, okay. period. There's there's no interaction. There's no anything. They are only here to attack or cast spells. That's it. Okay. So when John came back to the game, they were pissed at him personally. They were pissed at him because his character fucked up the game when he wasn't there. And that just yeah. goes like that is that is that is very bad on the DM. They shouldn't have done that. I don't think he ever played again. I wouldn't have either. No, if my if if I'm not there and I allow somebody else to play my character or I allow the DM to run my character, I expect them to, at the very minimum, uphold what my character does. I don't expect them to make hard choices with my character. If there's a role play scenario that comes up, man, they're just a fucking bystander. Uh, but you know, when it comes to combat, they—that's all you really need. Can I throw spells? Can I attack things? Uh, there really shouldn't ever be any sort of actual real role play scenario when somebody's missing for that character. And sometimes yeah. that sometimes that causes crap things to come up like you were saying because your uh goliath fighter wasn't there this past weekend there's an alliance that was made that very well may not have been made sucks for you know it sucks for the player but at the same time they have to understand they weren't there the scenarios already happened you can't backtrack it and you just sort of have to deal with it once you get back into game yeah, uh, I would I would make the suggestion to the the player that in a scenario like that you just let it go, 
you know, all right, maybe you wouldn't have actually wanted that to happen, but it's done and over with. You know, don't cause a stink about it in game. Yeah, I don't think he's. I don't think the player is going to care much. You know. Yeah, well, I'm. Just, I'm just saying to yeah. anybody who ends up in yeah. that scenario. So it's. I don't like people playing other people's characters, no matter what. It's just it, it the the end results are never positive. You know what I mean? Well, never I, I I disagree. Uh, if if the only thing they are there for is combat, and and that is the only thing they are run in, which is pretty much how that's that's what I allow within my game. It is a positive simply from the fact of the players have more power. Because if you're running them in a scenario that's written up for five characters and they would only have four, that's a fucking detriment. That makes that a lot harder. And some scenarios are almost unwinnable without that full complement of people. Yeah, I, I, I can get that, but I'm. I guess for me personally, it's something that I've never really tried to. Um. I can dance the the encounter down fairly easily, and that may be something that I'm good at, that not all DMs are good at. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's like I'd rather I'd rather dance dance the the encounter down. I mean, me, me and you, we've been playing, anything. we've been running long enough. We can adjust any encounter for any number of characters as necessary to make it harder or easier. But yes, for for somebody who's only been DMing for a couple of years, that can be a challenge. Get yeah. good, scrub. <laughs> yeah, get good. Uh, yeah, no, with DMing, the only way to get good is to fucking do it. Like, there are no courses. I saw somebody online asking if there were any courses to teach how to dungeon master. Uh, I guess that's basically what our podcast is. But there, there is really no proper way to learn to DM other than doing it, failing miserably at it, and getting better from your mistakes. Yeah, and, and you're going to, I think we talked about it before, you're going to make the same exact mistakes every other DM has made in the past. And only when you're on that side of the table and you wit- you witness those and you experience those the first time, you know, do you kind of go, huh, I understand this now. This is difficult, but. And then you just, you push through it. You, you got to ultimately know you're there to have fun with your friends and you're not there to win. You know, so if you're a very competitive person and you need to basically be winning all the time, just just be a player. <laughs> yeah, be be a player. If if your only goal is to win, be the player, and don't be a dick if you are, because then you're just going to make enemies of everybody at the table. <laughs> I mean, it, it's the truth. You know, everybody is trying to play these games and have fun, but every day I read horrible scenarios of players who just don't get that or occasionally the dm who just doesn't get that and it leads to hurt feelings lost friendships and a bad time for everybody Uh, yeah i i read every other day about somebody getting booted out of a game and then the game flows fucking smoothly after that everybody has a good time just because one person was gone yeah and sometimes you're not the right you're not the right fit for a play not not the right player for a dm sometimes the dm's not right for, for the players it's it can kind of go both ways you know that's also then, very true yeah and then sometimes it's a player you have to figure out how the dm operates and adjust with that so if he's not good at um uh, you know adjusting huge amounts of combats on the fly and reconfiguring an entire dungeon because you guys decided to do something super smart and skirt half of it away, give him the the time, give them the time that they need to adjust that game. You know, I'm, I find myself pretty good at that because I usually have a lot of options there and I have a lot of tokens and being online helps a lot. And yeah, my players did something insanely crafty in the last session. We spent like four hours in one section of the dungeon. I, yeah, I saw that. What the hell? <laughs> in in the amount of time that you spent in that one room, my players went all the way across Icewind Dale, across the Sea of Moving Ice, and, and onto an island. 
as well as like hit a whole bunch of other locations. Yeah, but at the same time, it's like, okay, so that's that's the situation they have presented to me. I could have easily just hand waved it away and let them keep you know dungeon crawling through the dungeon, you know, nothing else changing, or I could have changed a dungeon completely and have it be lived in. They spent 12 hours in a room locked behind a door, a barricaded door. Like if you, if your DM is on unable to adjust to, you know, the passage of time in a dungeon, then, then so be it. You know, let them, let, let it be easy on them. Don't bring it up. You know, don't insult them really. You know, if they can't do that, uh, it was easy for me because I just started taking troops from other areas. I'm like, okay, they're all going to be here. They're going to talk about this, and they're going to do this, and they're going to stay in here. And then all of a sudden, they're going to hear them because they failed that stealth check horribly. I think they got like a six. So, you know, everybody has a different style to them. And... Yeah, so Dungeons & Dragons, or role-playing games in specific, there there's a lot of components to them. There's the role-playing aspect of it. There's the strategy combat aspect of it. You then have the world-building aspect of it, the storytelling aspect of it, and so forth. Like, there's so many little components to run a role-playing game. Every DM is not going to be strong in all of the points of it. You know, role-playing NPCs is probably my weakest fucking point. It's not something I particularly enjoy doing most of the time, and I am not particularly good at it. Running strategy encounters, world building, storytelling, I've got all of those down pretty well. But if a player joined my group who's expecting hardcore role playing, you know, like some of the shit that you see on Critical Role, uh, where you have the DM just falling into character for the next half an hour and role playing with these people, they wouldn't get that under me. That's not what I'm doing. Uh, fortunately, all of my players understand this. They know where my strengths lie. They know where their strengths lie. And the vast majority of us all prefer the aspects that I do. So it works out well. You know, I- Anybody who's trying to find a game, you have to find the right game master as well as the right group of players. If you're not the right fit, move along, find what you're looking for. There are enough people out there to make that happen. So, you know, I was thinking of something when you're talking. When uh, while I'm while I'm over here rambling, <laughs> <laughs> like one of the weaknesses I have is I don't, I, I'm not very good with NPC role play. I I don't, I can't get into their character very well. You know, I have a few characters I can do, uh, and then the generic ones like, oh, dwarfs are Scottish, kind of kind of dumb bullshit. <laughs> um, but I still don't change my voice. I, I'm not. I I can't can't voice act i and will we were, do that. we were we were voicing we were we were joking about that at the beginning of our stream and you know there was some discussion being made between the alliance that was being made and the other players and a couple other enemies in the in the in, in the encounter and then my brother my brother sends me 100 bits on twitch and goes uh Here's some bits for all the great, amazing voices you all are doing. Just throwing out the shade at us. <laughs> Troll. More voices. Wow, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Just, I, I, I just, just. I had yeah. a weird, I had a weird role play scenario come up this weekend that I've never run into before, where two NPCs who knew each other ran into each other. And they hate each other. So I had to role play them arguing at each other. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I kept that very brief. You know, it was one person calling the other one a liar, and then they returned calling them a liar, and you know, then I tell the the players and they continue arguing for a few minutes before they finally stop. Just to <laughs> short that up. Because nobody wants to listen to me role playing two NPCs who fucking hate each other. Nobody wants that. Uh, so prep work, this is another thing that I had seen come up recently. What kind of prep work do you actually have to do to run one of your games? 
None, because it's a campaign setting in a book. Well, obviously, you have to do some prep work. You have to create. You have to create tokens. You have to read over the book, if nothing else. I read it on the fly half the times. Do you really? I'm, I'm not entirely joking about that. <laughs> uh, well, no. I mean, there's no. That's not necessarily a wrong way to do it if you can. I uh, I, I read the book and get an idea of what is happening. Um, and I try. I don't try to go through for with a fine tooth comb until like it's like the day before then i usually read it and refresh and try to see if there's anything that i would have missed yeah um i find that i have plenty of downtime on the stream to kind of look through the book and check room by room if they're missing something or doing something you know that that would be important to them and there's times that i've missed things and i've just snuck them in other places you know without the players knowing yeah uh getting tokens is usually pretty easy um there are plenty of sites out there that let you download the tokens. Uh, if not, then I have a bookshelf full of miniatures that I that I use in in real real time. Yeah, like prep mm-hmm. work is different between online games and in person yeah. games. Maps, if I if I want if I, if I want if I want the map that they use, like the book, or reference it, or find a really good one online, I will go to uh, Staples or Office Max, and I will have it printed out on architect paper in color. For like five dollars for like a about 30 by 50 grid is what fits on one of those mm-hmm. and that's a good size map for people to play on um and that's usually what i design maps to be around uh and if it's also in person then i also have a box of just random random maps so i will let um i'll just have those at the handy just to kind of plop them down and go okay it's actually snowy, but it's not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> use your imagination for once. Um, but with the campaign book, it's, it's just kind of, you're running them through that, you know, and pray they don't decide to derail the campaign by allying themselves with the big bad end guy and going crazy. Yeah. Like you've done a lot more online as far as running campaigns than I have. Plus you've run actual uh, book campaigns. For, I mean, that's really all you've ever done from my understanding. So for me, this is brand new, having to go through this and learn how to do it out of the book. Normally, I can just wing shit. For this, I have to know where they're going, where they're going next after they're finished with where they're going. Uh, then, because I'm doing it on Roll20, I have to have all of the tokens already prepped. I have to have the maps on there. Some of the maps that I have for the uh, Icewind Dale thing... They have the ten foot squares, which the, you know, that's not viable on, on there. So I end up having to basically create maps for those and use them. So I have to pull out fucking dungeon draft, spend a couple hours making stuff there. Uh, I mean, it, it should be it should be viable because you set the size of the grid squares on roll twenty, don't you? No, I tried that. Like I set it to the mm-hmm. ten foot. It didn't. It does not matter. It's it's it because. No, I mean, like- they're drawn, a, they, the map is drawn out as a ten foot square. Right. So can there, you re- there's no can you, there's no way to change that, unfortunately. Can you position the grid and how it lays down and how big the grid squares are? I I played with it. Maybe I'm not an expert on roll twenty. Like I spent half an hour messing with it. I could not get it to the specifications that I wanted. So instead I just spent half an hour drawing two maps on Dungeon Draft. So you you may want to look into that because it'll probably save you some time because well it, well, it won't now because all of the other maps that are left in there are five foot squares. So so, I, so I'm past the point that it matters. I run Foundry, and Foundry lets me import an image that's like the background map uh, for the scene as they call it, and then I can increase and decrease the size of that, and then I can also uh, increase and decrease the size of the grid that is on it and I can then position the grid essentially however I want it to be. So I basically have to find like the central part of the map, align the grid with that like central cross and then adjust the image, the, the image size and the grid size until they match up across the entire map. So even if they were 10 foot squares, 20 foot squares, 
I could just adjust those squares while keeping the two by two or four by four in the, in the giant square. So I wouldn't have an issue with that. With and then I would just go ahead. Then I could just make the grid whatever color I want to kind of match or blend in. Yeah, with roll twenty, it's it's automatically set to five foot squares. You can change it to other squares. Uh, you can change the size of the maps, and I'm sure if I played with it enough, I could make it work. But yeah. it was just, it, it was so much easier for me to just make a couple other maps than to fuck with that thing. It takes me about five ten minutes at most to to get the maps aligned. Yeah. Sometimes it's perfect right from the load. Sometimes it takes a long while. Because a lot depends on like the map maker too. Sometimes they get things that just don't seem to line up right. Yeah. Um, I would I've prefer had, a, grid, had a gridless version. That are, I've had plenty of maps that are not made for Roll20 and they will not line up with Roll20. If I uh, if I can get a gridless version, that's what I go with and just put my own grid size over it. Oh, that'd be great, yeah. Gridless would be fucking fantastic. There's hard to find. Usually I ask the artist if I find something that I like. Like, hey, can you take off all the lighting on your map and the grid? And can I get that? Because yeah. I want to set the lighting mood on my side. So, like, if it's nighttime, I can put make it nighttime. If it's daytime, I can add my own ambient light to it. Yep. Um, a lot of people still design maps with the idea that they're going to be printed out and then, like, played on. And that kind of, like, ruins a lot of the usage that I can get from something. Like, if it's a really cool tavern... And you, as a map maker, have have already lit the map the way you think it should be lit, and then made it nighttime. Well, now I can't use that that, that map for daytime. But if you give me a daytime map with no lights, I can add lights in, and then I can use the map tools to make it nighttime. Yeah, see, that's something I would never I would never have thought about that, but it absolutely makes sense. Uh, I most. Most of the DMs I know, you know, we're all pretty new to running online. You know, it, it's always just something we do this in person. So now we have access to all these other tools and things that we're having to learn and sort of play with, at least for a few more months until we're able to actually meet in person again. And yeah, so having a map that's not lit up and no grid, that would be fantastic because then we can make the adjustments as we feel needed. And so, like... I think Watsy has probably the policy where they're not going to ever release good maps in the books. Um, like the first couple of maps have all been like black and white with just kind of like doors and walls, mm -hmm. maybe some vegetation at best because they don't want people just grabbing those things and then making it the map, you know, for whatever reason. Like, yeah, I know that they have the thing, the, 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 the collector's edition, that they make with uh, whatever the, the big company is. Beetle and Grimm's. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard you mention them before. Beetle and Grimm's has a platinum edition that they're allowed to release that comes with, like, every single map for the campaign setting. Like, uh, they have the map for the fortress, uh, the throne room, Caves of Hunger, a study, 10 town maps, a map for each 10 town, and then um, a modular tundra map. And then they have, like, the encounters on, like, cards. So, like, you could easily reference those. Um, and the maps are, like, really good maps, too. Like, the ones straight out of the books, and then they add extra stuff to them. And then the, the Platinum Edition came with... Um, uh, a necklace, one of the handouts you're supposed to get, and then a pin of one of the big monsters in Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's well worth it's like three thousand dollars they they charge <laughs> for it. Hard pass. Um, but like, why don't they release map packs for each each book? Like, if you say, okay, here is here's the here's the book, here's the DM screen that goes with it. Here's the, all the maps for all the all the major encounters that we have, and it's fifty bucks for that, you know, or whatever. I'd buy it, you know. Uh, I I personally would probably not buy that, but I absolutely there are enough DMs who would, you know. And if I was going to run that campaign, maybe not fifty bucks, but 
25 bucks or something for all uh, access to all those maps and everything ahead of time. Yeah, that's a good fucking buy. Yeah. But I mean, it does let other people who create maps kind of flex their their muscle and make good maps. Like there is a guy called Pogs Props. P O G S, one word. Props is the other word. P R O P R O P S. Mm-hmm. He has a patron and he does all the maps for like all the encounters and major areas for every book. So like he's done most of Icewind Dale. He did all of Vernus, all of Terry of the Dragons, all of Dragon Heist. And he does Star Wars maps and Underdark maps and just Foundry maps and just maps for everything. Map maps for days. This guy is the best map maker out there. And like there is a market for that. And I'm sure he I'm sure this is his main job, given just well, based on his Patreon alone. So, you know, check yeah, him I'm... out. And if you need some Icewind Dale maps, check there. I think you were looking for one in particular, and he hasn't gotten there yet. Yeah, I, I didn't see it, so I just made them on uh, yeah. Dungeon Draft right quick. I didn't, need anything, I didn't need anything fancy. I just needed basically the layout of it. And... Yeah. And then you can always just check out, you know, Reddit, you know, the subreddit yeah. for I, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. You can probably find the map search you need. I know the yeah, other. Yeah, it was weird too because I, I, you know, I did Google searches and went to a few different places and I found all of the other maps for that scenario except for the one that I needed. <laughs> Didn't exist um, as far as I could tell, so I just made it. I know that. Uh, on Reddit, they have uh, there's a Reddit for every single major D and D campaign book, mm-hmm. and they have like a sticky at the top of the page that says, "Okay, here's the book. Here's here's every single chapter. Here's links to all the resources you would need. Here's links to other things that make these sections better." You know, like for Waterdeep and Troll School Manor, like they gave a link to like this is how to make the the manor into a real bar and actually charge the players a, a, a real price bar. that makes sense. <laughs> sorry I, I can never i can never hear the phrase uh i'm a real or i make it into a real something or other without fucking thinking of that so speaking of campaign books and all that stuff i know you're were, you're were talking about battle maps and stuff yeah. i got a lot that were i got a lot of battle maps in fourth edition they repackaged all of them and sold them again in 5th edition as all brand new battle maps. And they're not. (laughs) Yeah, I remember you telling me this. I was like, wow, that's fucking just... Man, that is some trailer park bullshit right there. Yeah, and they were the same price. So I'm not bothered by that. But the the ones I got came in a nice little box. And the ones they sent it come in a piece of paper. Like, wrapped around it. That's it. Yeah. Um, but you know, whatever. I, I am perfectly fine with use reselling resources. Just don't make it a different product. Call it the same thing. Here is the D Dungeon and Dragons Map Pack Volume One. You know. Reprints just, from fourth edition. Well the other thing is the reprints because you just call it the same thing you called it in fourth edition. Oh right that. Now. Yeah. And you're saying, okay, these are the ones we're reprinting well, always. You know? I, I would honestly I would rather they say that it's a reprint from fourth edition just because of the fact that if the people who have never seen these maps wouldn't know that that's what it's from, then they pull this out to all their friends and they're like, Hey man, look at this. I got all these brand new maps. Nobody's ever seen these before. And then they get laughed at, uh, because they have all these fourth edition maps that all their friends have already played before. Did, did I ever tell you about the, um, <laughs> the, ta- uh, the crap. Uh, what's that stupid tavern in water deep with the hole? idea since i don't really run much uh yeah, you, know, you know what it is it's got that that adventurer in it yawning portal the yawning portal oh that did one. I re- okay did yeah. i tell you the yawning portal map story that i had I, not that i recall you probably have but i forget things constantly so i i seem to forget things i did last just week like well. just like those are brand new maps this is a brand new story <laughs> did i tell you about killing blows on players nope <laughs> no. nope we definitely right. haven't talked about that on the podcast last week. <laughs> you should stop me, asshole. <laughs> I was going to let you finish. But anyway, that, that's uh, going to be cut out of the podcast, but this is not. 
But yeah, Chris, uh, Chris totally tried to talk about the same conversation we had last week. Whatever. Anyway, anyway yawning portal. So I, I was running Waterdeep for the first time, and I was actually printing out the yawning portal battle map that they that you can find online. Yeah. And I was using up a, uh, spent like a little bit of money, got it printed out, and got it all taped together. It was looking good. And then I came home, and I was kind of looking, and it's like there's something vaguely familiar about this. And so then I'm 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 going through all my maps, my box of maps, trying to figure out like on a couple other maps that I may need that are city themed for the water deep session. And then I remember that I bought a box set fourth edition, which was essentially adventures in yawning portal, but they were just like quick adventures that go down the yawning portal and do deal with the mad mage stuff. And I open up that box and pull out a high res high gloss copy of the yawning portal map. Totally did it to you again. Yep. Yeah. So. Uh, what I'm waiting for, I, I want them to go back. I know it'll never happen, but I would love for them to just reprint all the maps from second edition. There's a lot of not, them. They might not own those. No, I, I, I doubt they do. Uh, yeah. Well, they, I mean, WotC bought out TSR, so they probably do, but I know they're. They probably don't have the rights from the artists. That's a fair point. They own. Yeah, they would own all of the uh, storylines and the characters and so forth, but they might not own all of the art. Uh, I, I know that the uh, uh, most of the artists are going to own their own shit. So, yeah, especially back then, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of fourth edition, I was actually going through my old books because I wanted I wanted to try to figure out what I'm going to do next after Icewind Dale, and I thought, yeah, it would be really kind of cool to go back to fourth edition. And maybe do some of the stories that I could never do in 4th edition. Because going from 4th edition stats to 5th edition stats are pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And I was going through all my books. They never released a campaign book. Like in 5th edition. Uh, like, yeah, they were they were actually dropping modules. Right. They have like, I have like a, I have a couple folders that are like, hey, here's the keep on the Shadowfell modules. Yeah, because I have the Crystal Staff module floating around here somewhere that I picked up. I don't know how because I didn't buy any 4th edition stuff. Right. But they never actually released a book that was like, hey, here is all of Icewind Dale. Here is all of, you know, Neverwinter. They have campaign setting books, but there's no stories in them. Yep. Was, they didn't I found that really they weird. Didn't re they didn't release any of that until 5th edition. And that's, so, was, it, was, it that, was it that way in 3rd? So second edition is all those little modules, like what I'm talking about with the crystal staff. You know, it's these the little folders basically with the I don't know 50 pages in there, and that's that's your campaign module. You know, it, typically it's like covers four or five levels for characters. Uh, third edition, I don't think they released any modules or anything for third edition. I can't recall any. There are a Fuckload of campaign source books for you know, for pretty much all over the Forgotten Realms and Dragonlance and everywhere else, but I don't recall there ever being any modules for Third Edition. I think they expected everyone to create your own stuff. Here's all the hmm. information you're going to need and go. Yeah, as far as like these fifty dollar. 250 page how, how many pages is Icewind Dale what is this this Sorry, is uh, 320 pages worth I like I never saw these until 5th edition because like I remember I ran the the, the, the the book module things in 4th edition you know I ran Keep on the Shadowfell and I started the Troll Haunt thing and I went to Hammerfast and I did the, the Nintir Veil ones essentially Yes. And um, I was quite taken by surprise when I was going back and looking through the books, just like, there's no campaign books here. I found it very weird. Like, it, it kind of took me back. Like, it was a very bad memory. Like, I tried to like, push away, <laughs> you know? Yeah, the way they did it in fourth edition was the exact same way that they have always done it. Uh, I know from because I own a bunch of the basic Dungeons and Dragons ones, like pre Redbox edition. 
because uh, there there was a there was a uh, I think it was just called Dungeons and Dragons when it first started. Then they did Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which was the full blown game, and then they did Basic Dungeons and Dragons in the late seventies is when that was released. But the, I own a lot of modules from that. And yeah, like there's just you know short little modules and takes you for you know, a few levels, but there is so much fucking world information from those settings in those things. Like it would have been worth worth getting them just so you had that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, every one of them had fuck tons of maps and everything else. Hmm, that's interesting because because I guess I kind of realized that the Eperon book in Five E is just source material. And there's no campaign in it. I remember I got it for Christmas when I ever actually looked at it. Don't hate me. <laughs> I I don't hate Eberron as a setting. It's a place I would probably never run though. I I tend to prefer low tech as opposed to sort of high tech. I know I've talked about this at least a little bit on the podcast, but I'm not a fan of gnomes and you know flying airships. And when I say gnomes, I mean the uh, them creating all that wonderful technology of steam engines and everything else. Like, I feel like that's a fucking, it's a carryover from world of Warcraft. Cause that was not a thing in earlier editions of dungeons and dragons. Like second edition, there was no high technology. Most high tech you got was a fucking blunderbuss, which would blow up in your face half the time. <laughs> so speaking of world of Warcraft, um, I know you really haven't kept up much with the game, yep. but when they ended the now two expansions ago <laughs> expansion, they left the uh, the drain eye with a flying uh, fortress. Okay, this fortress. <laughs> this sounds that, familiar. <laughs> this fortress that flew, okay, has a giant space laser on it that can just nuke sites from orbit and take things out completely and utterly. I some so of, firmly, some of that I, sounds like some of it sounds like Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> I so firmly believe that they meant to end the story there, but they couldn't. And that the writer just have like conveniently forgot that they have this giant space laser. It's like, oh Sylvanas is taking over the horde. She's evil. Huh. Yeah, can we just nuke her from orbit with our giant space laser? No? Why? No answer? No response? None? Let's just laser beam her. And of course there probably is some stupid contrived oh we're actually flying and we're scouting out the the nether regions of space for more nether bad or some dumb bullshit. For the next big bad guys that'll show up in the next expansion. It's it's like it's like when they wrote Captain Marvel into the MCU and like, oh shit, how do we deal with her now? She's too powerful. Yep. Yeah. Some. Yeah, you know, I think with World of Warcraft because it's it's just money. I mean, they just make so much money off of the game that they don't want to end it. But they've storyline wise, I feel like they have been done since Cataclysm, <laughs> which was I don't know a decade ago. I wouldn't say they were done with Cataclysm. Warcraft three set up enough with the old gods to finish out that story. Well, uh, let me let me sort of get to the point though. With Dungeons and Dragons, Forgotten Realms more specifically, I feel like that campaign is overdone and it should have wrapped up. Like if they were telling a story, the campaign itself, the fucking setting should have been wrapped up. But it keeps going and going and going and going and feel like more contrived and more um uh, I don't know. I don't want to. I, I don't even want to say it's lazy because you know they get new writers and everything else. But it's just more information piling on top of old information piling on top of old information. It's so hard to keep up with everything. It's like that picture when they released Candlekeep of the guy that just highlighted the Sword Coast and said "Remembered Realms" and then faded the rest of the map and said "Forgotten Realms" over here. You know, yeah. Like no yeah, one's I, touching any other area of. And the Sword Forgot Coast, is, the Sword Coast is a. I don't know the first thing about the Sword Coast currently because I haven't run all these other campaign modules that came out that all take place in the fucking Sword Coast. Yeah. You know, I have no information on that. 
I do have information on all the previous, like third edition, Sword Coast and everything else. But in third edition, uh, earlier editions, there was information released about all of the realms. All of it. Yeah, if you want to run something up there, I mean, I guess you can just run what's in the module. But if you really wanted to build a campaign there, man, you need a lot more information. Yeah, I guess you're going to spend a lot of time on Google. There's a wiki for, for yeah, forgot, forgotten yeah, realms. The, the Forgotten Realms wiki is where you'll be at. It's like when I was trying to run the Star Wars game, I, I looked for specific areas that I wanted to run the game in, and I only looked up information on those areas. Because I don't yeah. have to know the entire galaxy. I just need that little section that I'm playing in. But that actually that actually harkens back to the prep work that we're talking about. Like if you're creating a campaign or running it in a setting that's already there, there's a lot of prep work, especially in knowing the details. Because you can run into players who know a lot more details than you do. Forgotten Realm, or sorry, uh, Icewind Dale, I'm very familiar with because I read all of the fucking dress novels. <laughs> but I have players who have never read any of them. If one of them tried to run the campaign there, you know, there'd be little things I'd be pointing out that they wouldn't know about. Yeah, and yeah, I try to do some research on the characters that I know. Like I did a lot of research on Kara Koenig, so I knew a lot about that. So whenever they got to Kara Koenig, there was definitely a lot more RP sessions than than normal. Um, but mm-hmm. all in all, it's uh, I, I try. I try to try to I try to know enough that the players wouldn't won't be disappointed if they try to do something crazy. Like I could never run a Star Wars game because there's just too much there for me to know. Too many fucking nerds who know too much about damn Star Wars. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I love you, Eric. I love you, but yeah, yeah, don't nerd out on us, bro. <laughs> It's so hard, man. It's it's like listening to you talk about Godzilla and Kong. I don't I don't care enough. I don't care enough. I just want to want to have kaiju fights. That's it, man. Just giant kaiju fights. I don't need to know all the intricacies of any of that. Then just go watch Godzilla Final Wars. I've seen it. It was good. I enjoyed it. Watch it again. I would gladly watch it again. I would watch it for Don Fry's mustache. That's all I needed. <laughs> <laughs> Don Fry's mustache and Bob Sapp in the same movie. Enough. Plus, they're flying like a spaceship, too, which is awesome. Dude, he, he does that, like, 360 no-scope, super Kamehameha, red dragon breath attack against King Ghidorah. Man, it's just it's <laughs> everything I wanted in a Godzilla movie. Also, I think nearly every episode of our podcast, somehow we hearken back to Godzilla. Well, I know, like, I know three things in life. I know Godzilla facts. I know Three Stooges facts. And I know enough about D and D to run a pretty decent game. You sound exactly like me. I know three things. I know Ultimate Fighting Championship. I know our LARP that we play, and I know Dungeons and Dragons. Also, I know I know a little bit about hockey, but not a lot. I don't know the LARP that we play. Like, it's like <laughs> fucking character. Uh. Hey, Dredd, do you know anything about this? Is it giant related? No. Is it gargoyles? No. Nope. I don't know anything. Those are the only two things I know. Giants and gargoyles. Which pisses me off when people do things with giants or gargoyles and they don't bring me in on it. Like, this is the two things I can do. You better bring me. But anyway. Uh, yeah. So prep work, man. Prep work, uh, it's an important aspect. I, I, if you ask my wife, I spend all Saturday from about noon or two working on the game, rereading stuff, setting up stuff like, you know, getting the stuff there and working. I usually don't do any prep work during the week, but that's usually with the time that I take. So I am working D and D every day from, or on Saturday, every Saturday from noon to, to about midnight. So about eight to 12 hours a day on that day. So, so Saturday, so you, you spend eight to 12 hours on Saturday setting all this up. Yeah. But, but if it's a big dungeon, I get the whole dungeon set and then I don't have to do any prep work until they're done with the dungeon. So on Saturdays, when I'm setting up game, I tell everybody that I'm working on my D and D game all day. Uh, then I play seven days to die for about two hours. I take a nap, 
play Overwatch for about an hour, and then there were when there's two hours before game time, I do everything. I crunch it all. Because, <laughs> well, that's that's just how I do things. Uh, I am starting a new campaign once I'm finished with Icewind Dale, and my god, I have so much prep work to do. <laughs> I have 22 maps of towns that I have to make up before I can start this thing. Because I really do want it to be an open world and let the players just go where they want to go. I know the basics of the storyline, but I actually need to write up the specifics of it. I need then need to put together at least the first dungeon. And then I have to start creating the NPCs and the information on all of the locations, all of the towns. Because I, I want them to sort of be living and breathing, so they have to have their own world behind it. More so than just the maps, who runs these towns? What's their economy like? Who do they hate? Who do they like? What alliances do they have? So forth. There's a lot of shit that goes into this. And are you going to package this up and sell it? Probably not. See, and that's the problem. You need to package all it up and sell it. I don't care about sell. I'm not looking to make money off my D&D game, man. I am looking to run a great D&D game. I want my players to enjoy it. If I can make money off of it, awesome, but that's not my goal. We'll talk later on that. Yeah. Maybe some of the modules, I might package them up because those can easily be separated from the campaign to be run and you know, anything. <laughs> All right. I think we've covered enough this week. Yep. I'm exhausted. Well, hi, exhausted. I'm Jay, and we are the Grumpy Dungeon Masters. Biggity bam. We're out of here. Stop it with that quote, man. No one wants a catchphrase. Every week. No. Give me a new one. Um, sure. It's...